Monday morning! I am MPJ, and you are watching Fun Fun Function. This is part two of the questions and answers uh, double episode vacation edition that I'm doing, and I'm recording both of these at the same in the same day, which makes it super weird. The previous episode is there. What was the most difficult bug or problem you faced, and how did you solve it? Oh man. Back when I was a much younger programmer, I, uh, I did the e-commerce backend for my uh, own company at the time. And uh, we, I did it in ASP.NET. ASP.NET uh, had, at the time, this very cool thing. I think it was called a data set. Not sure exactly what it But it was, you could basically load uh, your database into like an in-memory state. And then you performed operations on it and you said sync and it automatically synced down to the database. It was strongly typed and it was, ah, it was super cool. So I used that and uh, things were great and dandy. Everything worked. It was a great cool architecture. It wasn't really, but I thought so at the time. And as, uh, and as time progressed, uh, we, uh, we got more customers and uh, I uh, decided to buy a new server, a uh, Pentium 4 hyperthreading server. We moved the site to the new server and uh, uh, everything was a lot faster, but just subtle weird things started to happen. People would report that things were uh, disappearing from their shopping carts and they were reporting that uh, they were paying but their order was not being sh showing up as paid. Basically, they were reporting the worst possible bugs an e-commerce site could have. But actually not. It turned out to be even worse because those people ended up, like, the payment that they did ended up paying the orders of other people. So there was a payment that just, they shut away and then it hit another order. It was just nightmarish. And this was because the data set uh, that Microsoft brought, that was not, uh, that was never intended to be uh, thread safe. So when we introduced this hyper-threading server, which was, uh, by this time, like, it was pretty uncommon with uh, multi-core processors, but this was, this was actually not multi-core, but it behaved sort of like a multi-core. So when multiple sessions started messing with the data set at the same time, dunk, things broke. And again, this was pretty early in my programming career, so this was, this was the first time I encountered a problem with concurrency. The short-term fix that uh, I did for that was basically just to create a big lock uh, in the application, a global lock. So when one, um, one session needed to interact with the data set, it would basically just grab the global lock and say that nobody else is allowed to write to this data set uh, uh, until I'm done, and then it will do its, its thing and then release the lock. Which was just a dreadful solution because it completely negated any performance benefit from the hyper-threading server. I don't think we ever, I don't think we ever made a good uh, solution for it in that version of the code base. I think we just eventually rewrote it and created a completely new stack. That whole ordeal taught me a lot about uh, concurrency, but most importantly, it created uh, it created a, a pain in me related to uh, concurrency. It taught me that it's really, really important, like in a core level, uh, that to, to think about concurrency. Learning through fire and brimstone. Thoughts on ORM versus plain SQL versus some hybrid. ORMs. If you don't know what ORMs are, uh, it's, uh, it's a layer that you put between um, a relational database of a SQL database uh, and your uh, object-oriented uh, architecture, and it kind of creates this this mapping between your objects and classes and and the database. I've done a lot of um, I've I've worked a lot with uh, ORMs in my day. Uh, they were very cool when I first encountered them, uh, and over the years I have concluded that. They are basically insanity. You shouldn't use them. There are sane people that do disagree with me on that, but there are no sane people saying that you should use uh, a complete ORM model. You should always use it as a hybrid model. Uh, even like ORN uh, 
uh, the and hibernate guy he wrote a blog article recently saying that I've never said that this should be used for everything like ORMs are really good for like some parts of your app but uh, when you find yourself with a tricky query you should you should just use SQL uh, it, it's dumb not to use SQL for what it's for but I I personally don't think that there is a valid use case for them ever. Uh, it's whenever I've used an ORM, I always end up with this annoying middle layer that I have to coerce into doing what I want. And it's always ends up being really inefficient and uh, convoluted. What an ORM tries to do is that it tries to encapsulate uh, uh, your interaction with the database. And encapsulating is very very hard thing to do uh, correctly. Whenever I try to uh, encapsulate something, uh, it's very often that I fail. The encapsulation just ends up being it not really encapsulated. I I I the purpose of the encapsulation is so that I don't have to think about what it encapsulates. But uh, often uh, I fail on that mission, and I just when I interact with the encapsulated thing. I also need to, at the same time, think about what's inside the encapsulated thing, thus defeating the purpose with the encapsulation in the first place. And I find that uh, chances of me failing with encapsulating something, they increase the, the more complicated the thing uh, is that I'm trying to encapsulate. My chances increase if it's just a very simple thing, a very narrow thing that I want to encapsulate, like uh, make order. Or something like that. It's very narrow. It just does one thing. But if you try to encapsulate something as generic as interacting with the database, in my experience, that 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 kind of encapsulation is almost bound to fail. Trying to encapsulate something as generic as database interaction that is that is almost definitely bound to fail. Nowadays, I really like being close to the metal of the database. Uh, just do the query, create objects from that query, and uh, and return it. It's not that hard. It's very clear what is happening. It's very easy to track. It is easy. It's hard to write bugs in that code. It's eh, nice. You don't need an ORM. Or I shouldn't tell you what you need. I don't feel I need it anymore. Coming from C Sharp, do you miss types in JavaScript? I used to be a C Sharp programmer. Uh, no. I often ask myself why, though. It's very weird. Um, I, I also recently talked to a, another C uh, short programmer who has uh, recently started uh, doing JS, and he's doing this project where he, uh, he does the backend in Node. And I just asked him, like, uh, why do you do it, like, as a C sharp programmer, why do you do it voluntarily in Node when you could be doing it in, in C sharp? And I asked it because I, I felt the same way. I would have built it in Node, uh, but I, I just couldn't put my finger on quite what, what that was. And he said that he just feels a lot more productive in JS. And I can really relate to that. And what he said, it disturbed him that he just couldn't write something like this uh, in, uh, in C Sharp. Just declare a function. Uh, it has argument uh, a, a string that is argument text, and then you know da, 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 the implementation. Like JavaScript doesn't stand in your way; it just lets you do the thing that you want to do directly, and you do it. I mean, it doesn't hold your hand. This allows you to uh, do a lot of stupid things. But I think that uh, the reason I don't miss types as much, and he doesn't miss types much either is that we are both very aggressive unit testers. I think that helps a lot um, because it, it gives you a lot of the uh, safety that a type system does. It doesn't catch all the problems that a type system uh, checks. Like I, I don't want to put a type system down too much uh, because strong typing, strong static typing, uh, I think it's actually proven in studies that it creates, uh, it tends to uh, have a slight quality improvement. But for me, personally, uh, a weakly typed programming language that is very focused on letting me do what I need to do, coupled with a really good uh, unit testing suite, that creates a very productive and safe environment for me to work in. And I'm very happy about it.
As a junior dev, how much should you know? How much are you allowed to Google? And, uh, how much are you allowed not to know? Well, you're allowed to Google as much as you want. This is not school. You're employed to solve a problem. Nobody cares if you solve that problem by Googling or if you solve it by remembering it from another Googling. When we do interviews at, uh, at work, I don't, we never ask for like things that you can easily Google. I think that the interviewee should essentially be allowed to just uh, Google things. Uh, if, if you ask questions like that, I think that they're basically useless questions. Just memorizing facts, that's not a very useful skill as a developer. Uh, what is a useful skill is, you know, understanding the computer thing. What I'm looking for in an interview is not stuff like that. This is um, what, what I mean. I want to know what this this person is, uh, except for a googling. Do they know how? If if it's a web developer, do they know how the internet works? One question I was asked when I was interviewed at Google was, uh, I I really liked the question. Uh, it was, if you type an address uh, like yahoo.com into the browser and press enter, what happens? Like, where is it sent and how does the web page end up in your browser? How does everything work there? Having a person explain all that and more importantly, because there's gonna be steps where a person, you know, doesn't know and they uh, sometimes they are often uh, able to reason uh, their way to the next step. And that's also very important. Like, does this person have this innate understanding because they've used computers for such a long time and they have been programming for quite a while do they have a feel for how things are put together my advice uh to you as a junior dev is try to always keep a healthy interest in what you're doing like when you learn something try to not just learn how to use it but try to learn why it's there and a little bit like dig a little bit under the scenes of how does this work and how does this tie together with everything because a good interviewer will uh will know the difference uh after it, between you just knowing the upper layer of things or if you're the kind of person that uh digs a little deeper that's it for the second and final part of this questions and answers uh episode vacation edition next week we are back to our ordinarily scheduled programming you have watched an episode of fun fun function i release these every monday morning 0800 gmt time this episode was a bit weird because i'm on vacation uh but uh the other episodes are kind of like this. You should check out the channel below. Check out some of the other videos and see if this channel is something that you could, should, maybe consider subscribing to. I am MPJ. Until next Monday morning, stay tuned.